So you know, you don't use Zoom. We do sometimes, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Some of our teaching, but most of our teaching's on Blackboard. So, yeah, this is the the kind of SOAS platform of choice. Um, okay. Yeah, we end up doing some things in Zoom as well, so it gets a sometimes gets a little bit confusing, but. Mm -hmm. Um, great. We, we might go ahead and start, I think. Um, I can see that there are still some people coming in, but um, welcome, everybody. My name's Phil Clark. Um, I'm a professor of international politics at SOAS, and I'm also the co-director of the Centre on Conflict Rights and Justice. And that's the centre um, that this evening is uh, really honoured to be co-hosting this particular event uh, with the Aegis Trust uh, in Rwanda. Um, and uh, this evening, it's really fantastic to have with us uh, Dr. Gloria Uwezehe, uh, a really fantastic researcher who I'm so glad you're going to get to engage with uh, this evening. Uh, Gloria uh, is a, a research fellow in anthropology uh, at Dartmouth College uh, in the US. Um, she recently won a very prestigious Dartmouth Society of Fellows um, uh, fellowship at, at, at Dartmouth, one of the university's really uh, top postdoctoral fellowships, incredibly competitive and, and, and I think a, a, a real reflection of the importance of Gloriosa's uh, research. Um, Gloriosa has a professional background as a mental health nurse um, and then has very much moved into the, the academic space, researching in uh, domains of, of health and public health and, and anthropology, as I'm sure you'll see in her presentation this evening. Um, she's going to speak on uh, this evening's topic, which is youth uh, physical and mental health after rape during the 1994 genocide uh, against the Tutsi in Rwanda. Um, the format of this evening is going to be that um, the Glorias will present for sort of 30 to 40 minutes, um, and then there'll be lots of time to discuss uh, with all of you after that. Um, when we get to the discussion time, you'll see down the bottom of the screen that there's a hand function. You'll be able to put your hand up and, and ask um, whatever you would like um, of Glorieurs. Um, just a small housekeeping thing. I think all of you are listed as presenters in Blackboard, which means that you've all got access to Glorieurs' slides. I would just ask you not to touch the slides during the presentation because it's a bit disconcerting for the presenter if suddenly the slides start moving in this ghost-like fashion. So I'd really like it if only Glorieurs um, can manipulate um, those slides. And also, um, this evening's session is being recorded um, because we put these events out as podcasts in the next few days. So bear that in mind especially when it comes to the, the question and answer time. Um, so I'm just going to, Gloria, put your slides back up on the screen. And without any further ado, um, Gloria, it's a, a real privilege for, for both CCRJ and Aegis uh, to have you here this evening. Of course, we're conscious that this is the um, still the period of the commemoration of the genocide against the Tutsi um, in Rwanda. So this is a very timely presentation on a, on a very important topic. And, 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 and no one knows this topic better than you, Gloria. So we're very much looking forward to hearing your presentation this evening. Um, over to you. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Phil. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you for the opportunity to present my work on youth uh, um, physical and mental health um, after the geno genocide or rape during the 1994 genocide against Tutsi. I uh, would like to thank uh, SOAS Center on Conflict Rights and Justice and the Research po uh, Policy and the Higher, edu uh, Higher Education Program at AGC Trust for this opportunity to share my work. It's always a pleasure to be able to share the work and also hoping that uh, we um, generate new ideas, but also action to take care of this, uh, the people that I uh, focus on my study. Um, I will start my presentation. This study was conducted in Rwanda, just a little bit of um, geography. Rwanda is in East Africa. It lies 75 miles um, south uh, of Equator. It bordered uh, Uganda. Rwanda bordered Uganda, Tanzania, Burundi, um, and the um, DRC, Democratic Republic um, of the Congo. And also Burundi, I think I forgot to say. So the genocide against Tutsi, um, in 1994, Rwandans endured one of the most cataclysmic genocides in the history in a period of 100 uh, days that, um, where the genocide happened. 
uh, maybe a little bit more background on this. The genocide against Tutsi was a result of uh, decades of tension and uh, of tensions and conflict between Hutu majority and the Tutsi minority. And these are the ethnic groups um, constructed by Europe, uh, European colonialists. In a period of 100 days, over 1 million people were killed and rape was used as a, a weapon of uh, genocide. Approximately, uh, approximately 350 women were raped, but only one in six of them survived. It is estimated that between 2,000 and 10,000 um, children uh, were born of uh, um, genocidal rape. Now they are young adults, um, 26, 27, 25, 26 years uh, of age. They are now young adults. Uh, I want to talk about what does it mean to be conceived during the genocide against Tutsi? What are the consequences? There is a comparing evidence that maternal environmental experience influences uh, offspring health outcomes. Prior studies, including the Dutch uh, um, hunger um, study, uh, those studies on a prenatal adverse childhood experience, they suggest that exposure in the first trimester of genocide, please keep the slides <laughs> the same place. Thank you. Uh, prior studies on prenatal uh, adverse experience, including the Dutch uh, famine study, suggest that exposure in the first trimester of gestation leads to um, the lasting poor mental and health outcome compared to being conceived later um, or being exposed later in the pregnancy. Individuals who were conceived during the genocide against Tutsi, who were conceived by Tutsi women during that time, were exposed to maternal stress related to genocide or genocidal rape during the very beginning of their development, in the first trimester of, the, uh, of, of gestation, which is marked by rapid formation, uh, differentiation, and the growth of embryo. So this is the time where the body is starting to form, and most of the uh, organs and the system are formed during this, uh, the initial formation is during this uh, period. So given the influence of early life expo uh, adverse experience on subsequent health outcome, these uh, offspring were conceived during the genocide against Tutsi by Tutsi women who were uh, targeted by the genocide, are likely to uh, have a likely, um, high risk of stress-related uh, chronic disease. Most of chronic disease that we do observe, they are related with uh, uh, stress. For example, cardiovascular disease can be um, uh, associated by exposure to um, prenatal exposure. Uh, but individuals who are conceived by Tutsi women um, who were raped, uh, the genocide for those women who survived the genocidal rape, stigma, uh, stigma shame, and stress related to rape continued beyond at the end of genocide. And the children of gen uh, who were born as a result reported extreme life, uh, lifelong emotion and the mental health uh, challenges due to the stigma of their birth origins. So in addition to the mother's um, uh, stress, they also have, they do endure a, a lot of uh, experience, which, which put even them at higher risk of stress uh, related chronic disease. This relationship is supported by um, development origins of health and, the develop, uh, and the disease, DOHAD, um, and allostatic uh, load models. DOHAD suggests or uh, development origins of health and disease uh, model um, suggests that uh, psychological, nutritional, and, and other stress experience in utero through other uh, uh, childhood could. Uh, alter a growth and the development in ways that leads to, dim to diminished health adult. Aerostatic load um, model posits that wear and tear due to uh, sustained stress and the discrimination take a toll on health. So for these uh, uh, individuals conceived uh, by genocidal rape, they do have um, those kind of two exposure, prenatal exposure and postnatal exposure. So uh, as a conceptual model, we do apply a sensitized model uh, suggesting that the combination of extreme uh, stressful conception by rape and the lifelong uh, identity of having been conceived by the enemy uh, in a commission of rape combined to dispro uh, disproportionately affect health beyond the early life exposure to genocide uh, alone. In a particular for those conceived uh, via uh, genocide or rape. So in this study, um, uh, we have two M, 
Uh, of course, though, as, uh, though tragic, the Sedegas Tutsi provides a unique possibility to test this hypothesis or, or, or explore this relationship among humans. Uh, and the aim of this study, um, the, we, we had two aims. The first aim was to evaluate the relationship between a range of uh, adult mental and physical health outcomes and exposure to extreme uh, maternal stress related to genocide and the genocidal rape and to determine how exposure to cumulative stressors through, throughout the young adulthood, adult uh, childhood may ex exacerbate um, vulnerability to poor mental and health outcomes. The second aim, we evaluated whether the duration of ex uh, gestation exposure to, to maternal stress related to genocide or genocidal rape is associated with variation in health outcome. Does the, the length of exposure um, uh, predict any variation in health outcomes? So for the M1, um, the design of study, we uh, used a comparative and association cross-section design 91 24 year old Rwandans participated in this study, including 30 conceived by genocide or rape. We are used the term double exposed because they exposed to genocide and rape. And the 31 age and sex, um, age and sex matched uh, to um, young adults conceived by uh, survivors who were not raped or single exposed, exposed to genocide only. And uh, age and sex matched uh, 30. Uh, younger that born of women who were not exposed to um, neither or genocide or rape. These are the women who were outside the country. They were enrolled in the uh, in the study. So the total was 91 participants. All participants were estimated to have been conceived during the genocide by birthday to the period of genocide. The genocide is to happen from uh, April 7 to July um, 4th, 1994. Um, a convenient sampling method was used to recruit initial participants in the two ex exposed uh, group. The, uh, expo the double exposed group was, uh, was, uh, was uh, recruited through um, uh, Sevota, um, Solidarity for Development of wid Widows and Orphans to promote self-sustain um, and livelihood, uh, which the, is, uh, the name is in French, it is known as Sevota. And those who were exposed to genocide only were ex uh, um, recruited through uh, Avega Agahoso. Um, and each participant were in was invited to recommend age and sex uh, match um, Rwandan who uh, fall in any of these three categories of uh, uh, the studies. For the M1, the um, independent uh, variables were the level of exposure, double exposed, um, single exposed, and unexposed and the adverse childhood experience. So in addition to these levels of prenatal exposure as postnatal exposure, we use adverse uh, childhood experience national questionnaires to be able to capture what uh, the exposure after, uh, after birth. For the M2, which look at uh, the duration of impact of uh, uh, um, duration of exposure, we did only enroll. We did only um, did analysis uh, in that included two ex the two exposed uh, uh, group, and the, we tested the hypothesis that the duration of exposure to maternal stress related to genocide or genocidal rape is associated with a uh, uh, poor mental health outcome, with a shorter duration of exposure um, predicting better health outcome. I want you to um, I want to note here that uh, we did not hypothe uh, hypothesize that. This relationship uh, will be observed among those born of genocidal rape because um, given that these individuals are exposed to stress related to the mother's rape experience that continued beyond the acute period of genocide. So for them, the end of the genocide didn't necessarily mean uh, the end of exposure to maternal stress. So the independent uh, variable for this aim was the duration of exposure. The genocide against Tutsi happened during a period of one hundred uh, 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 during a period of twelve weeks and uh, uh, five days, and those conceived early in during the genocide had a longer exposure duration of exposure to maternal stress related to uh, genocide or genocidal rape, and if, so that means for those participants conceived at the beginning of uh, the genocide, the maximum of exposure um, have for some of them were um, twelve weeks and five days. 
for the measures we um for the measures we measured participant characteristics uh, sex marital status uh, re uh, residence family structure uh, um, who raised the person who raised or those who raised uh, the participant the level of education type of work social and demographic uh, and economic categories using of the hair categories we also measured uh, um, resilience using uh, um conon davidson resilience scale 25 um, as um, health outcome, we measured me mental and the physical health outcome. For mental health outcome, we measured um, uh, mental function using uh, the SF36, depression, anxiety, satisfaction with uh, social role using uh, PROMIS 29 version uh, 2.0. I also measured the PTSD, post-traumatic uh, stress, uh, post stress disorder using uh, checklist civilian version 5 um, or PC, PCL5. For the physical health outcome, for the physical health outcome, I measured physical function using SF36 and the pain intensity, pain interference with daily function, fatigue and sleep using PROMIS 29. Um, we also measured uh, um, anthropometrics, um, height, weight, waist, uh, hip, circumferences, and uh, skin fold uh, uh, thicknesses. I also did correct bio, some biomarkers to test. Uh, um, I did uh, to test CRP, which is a C uh, reactive protein, which is uh, a biomarker of uh, um, inflammatory. It is an uh, inflammatory biomarker, and also to um, do DNA analysis, uh, um, DNA methylation analysis. So I used I collected dry blood spots on uh, um, these uh, cards. So as a result for the M1, the findings of uh, under the M1 were published in this paper um, that just went out. Maybe Phil will help to share the uh, the link uh, so that you can read in in in, um, in your own time. So, but briefly uh, as um, result for this, we tested uh, uh, the difference between groups: the groups, the double exposed, single exposed, and unexposed. The three groups. And uh, to determine the difference between so for the difference between groups, we uh, use the bivariate um, regression analysis to determine the difference between group in mental health and the consistent with our prediction, individuals exposed to maternal stress related uh, to genocide only had the poorer mental function, higher of uh, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety and depression compared to young adults uh, who were not exposed to genocide or genocidal rape. So the third group, the unexposed group. And individual conceived by genocidal rape reported more um, depression and the PTSD compared to those prenatally exposed to maternal uh, genocide uh, stress only. As a physical health outcome, Individuals exposed to maternal stress related to genocide had, um, uh, had poorer physical function, higher scores of uh, pain intensity and pain interference with uh, daily function, and the poor quality of uh, sleep compared to young adults who were not exposed to genocide or, or, or rape. Individuals conceived by genocide or rape reported more pain interference with daily function compared to uh, uh, prenatally exposed um, to maternal genocide stress only. This is the first uh, study of which I am aware of um, that looks at physical um, health outcomes among this patient, especially with uh, the, uh, those exposed to genocidal rape. Given that this is a relatively young and lean and health population, it is meaningful that physical health is compromised. So though we did get uh, uh, much maybe on all the variables that we evaluated, but the fact that they have poorer physical health outcome, this is quite uh, something to, to note. The result demonstrated that uh, demonstrate uh, compelling. This result demonstrate compelling evidence that the double exposed young adult consistently exhibited the poorest health outcome. 
when even compared to those individuals conceived uh, during the genocide who were also exposed to genocide by exposed to genocide only this is a uh, there is a consistent this is consistent and significant additional risk um, of those uh, being conceived through genocide or rape for example as we saw um, they they, are, they have greater um, scores um, of PTSD depression and the pain interference of daily life our findings are consistent with uh, the previous study that uh, reported the difference in the health outcomes uh, among uh, the children of uh, survivors uh, in Rwanda, but also survivors of uh, the Holocaust, uh, compared to uh, the same um, the, the same age uh, children of uh, women who were not exposed. In a contrast, in our uh, to, to our study, these other studies did not um, explore the impact of uh, prenatal exposure to maternal stress related to, genoc to genocide, um, genocide or rape. Uh, no, they, they, they didn't measure the um, physical health outcomes. So that's a kind of like added value with uh, our study. Uh, women who were raped as part of genocide strategies to ex, uh, extremate um, strategies to um, kill um, the uh, uh, Tutsi, have reported experiencing um, intense shame or guilty as a result of their rape and uh, uh, subsequent conception, which also does uh, um, is reflected in health outcomes of uh, their offspring. Um, we also, in addition to bio. Uh, um, by variate analysis, we did um, multiple linear regression analysis uh, for each outcome was uh, performed with interaction term of adverse childhood experience um, as postnatal exposure. So the interaction we, we created an interaction term uh, of uh, prenatal exposure in each each of the three groups and uh, adverse childhood experience. And this uh, interaction um, multivariate regression an, uh, analysis did the control for um, sex, marital status, level of education, type of work, and resilience. Uh, for the past and the present family structure, we looked at was also uh, um, included. This is like who you have in the family, who you grew up with, who raised you up, but also the member of the family that are, are available. So the demographic uh, characteristics were um, controlled as we test the interaction term of prenatal exposure and adverse childhood experience. First, I want to highlight that among these groups, there were differences between these three groups in terms of adverse childhood experience, which is, is this uh, um, figure here. As, as you can see, the, those exposed to genocide only had higher um, levels of uh, higher scores of uh, adverse childhood experience compared to those unexposed, and those exposed to genocide rape have also higher um, uh, um, adverse, adverse childhood experience compared to those exposed to genocide only. So, in terms of interaction, um, uh, interaction between um, the prenatal exposure and the health outcome in a predicting the health outcome uh, among the group uh, conceived via genocide or rape. The effect of prenatal exposure on depression and uh, physical function, pain intensity, and the pain interference with daily life were exacerbated by adverse childhood experience, which was, of course, which was higher in this group compared to those exposed to maternal stress related to genocide only and those who are uh, um, unexposed. This finding that double exposed group have a higher adverse childhood experience and that this adverse childhood experience exacerbated the effect of prenatal exposure to rape, um, to exposure to, 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 to rape on health outcomes also suggests importance of postnatal and childhood uh, events. Uh, the vulnerability induced uh, by prenatal exposure to genocide or genocidal rape were magnified by adverse childhood experience, so prenatal, um, uh, postnatal experience, providing a less uh, favorable environment for growth and development and has elevated the risk for larger um uh, for large range of negative mental and uh, mental and physical health outcomes in adulthood however it, um, it is worthy noting uh, from this uh, moderation models that for those uh, for some in adverse child for some of the in, in the group of those who were conceived via genocide or rape 
health outcomes were comparable or even better than, uh, uh, than those of other uh, groups uh, exposed to genocide or no one exposed if adverse childhood experience were low. This uh, makes clear the importance of, uh, of um, the natal environment uh, where the low um, adverse childhood experiences uh, suggest a positive family, uh, supportive family, peer and community environment where uh, this process, uh, where the process of building um, individual uh, sufficient level of uh, resilience can take place. It is possible that those uh, uh, double exposed individuals with low um, adverse childhood experience were able to achieve a level of resilience that, uh, that improved their well being and uh, uh, kind of like mitigated the effects of uh, prenatal exposure. These findings are added to uh, the debate that suggests that early, adverse, uh, early life adversity is not overly determinant of long term health outcome but point towards the potential mitigation, um, the uh, potential of mitigating the effects of these extras if uh, evidence-based intervention are implemented. Adverse childhood experience may be, uh, uh, can be, may be um, prevent, uh, prevented, they are preventable and uh, uh, modifiable, and the resilience can be improved through a strength-based uh, intervention that enable individuals to, um, to harness the resources needed to mitigate this effect of adverse um, um, experience. So for the M2, um, as uh, the M2 was about looking at the duration of exposure, uh, we find out that the shorter the duration of exposure, the better the health outcome with low scores of anxiety and depression among those exposed to genocide, uh, to maternal stress related to genocide only. The association remains significant between the duration of exposure uh, um, and anxiety, even after controlling for sex and adverse childhood experience. Um, this uh, highlights the effect uh, of uh, prenatal exposure uh, because the prenatal, as I said, the first trimester is the most sensitive period of life. Where if they happen during that time, there is always uh, um, there is uh, not always there is a uh, risk increased risk of uh, um, poor mental health outcome in, in uh, um, postnatal. So this our study uh, does expand our knowledge on vulnerability in the first trimester as are reported in the Dutch uh, hunger study and others, which have highlighted that the first trimester is the most sensitive, but they didn't look at if the duration in that same um, uh, trimester has uh, kind of predict the variation of duration of exposure in the first trimester does uh, predict the health outcome. But what is was known um, is that the first trimester is always the most um, uh, sensitive compared to other um, uh, trimester of gestation. Um, so our study does expand on that uh, knowledge uh, by looking at the variation within this most sensitive uh, trimester, exploring this phenomenon in the context of psychological distress and uh, including different levels of exposure, the exposure to genocide or genocide the rape. The duration of exposure did not predict variation in any measured uh, outcome among individuals conceived by genocidal rape. This could be explained by the fact that stigma, shame, and stress related to um, rape experience by pregnant, pregnant survivor women did not cease by the end of the genocide, as I said earlier. It is possible that the fetus was uh, um, exposed beyond the stress uh, beyond the, the genocide, uh, uh, they were exposed beyond uh, the, the duration of exposure uh, to genocide because of uh, the, the stress uh, and the stigma that continues. In fact, survivors of genocidal rape consider this experience as, the worst, uh, as worse than uh, the genocide ex experience itself. As we uh, noted um, in our previous, in, uh, under the analysis of M1, uh, we demonstrated that these young people conceived via genocide or rape uh, reported more adverse childhood experience compared to the other group, those exposed to age and sex much uh, younger that conceived by, uh, by women survivors were not raped or those were not raped. Um, surprisingly, we find association um, between the duration of exposure and the physical health outcome 
And this could be because we have a relative um, young and uh, lean population, and that follow-up study are needed uh, to observe impact of early adverse um, adversity on physical health uh, as these participants continue to, to age. The, um, the uh, shorter uh, the relation between the shorter exposure to genocide uh, to genocide or geno uh, genocide uh, stress uh, related and a better health outcome can also be explained by the fact that probably the maternal um, buffering system that is usually in place to protect the the the, the fetus um, are capable to um, work if the duration of exposure is shorter they can be able to kind of like buffer those uh, effects. Summary, um, Rwandan adult, um, this study demonstrated that Rwandan young adults uh, conceived during the genocide have poorer mental and physical health outcome compared to sex and age matched Rwandan who were not uh, exposed to genocide rape who were conceived uh, during the genocide but not exposed to genocide rape. And those conceived by genocide rape had uh, additional burden of uh, um, poor mental and the physical health outcome compared to those uh, exposed to genocide only. Um, the shorter, this study also demonstrated that the variation in duration of exposure with the shorter exposure um, to um, prenatal maternal stress related to genocide only um, being as, uh, um, associated with uh, um, health, better health outcome. We also demonstrated that uh, persistent effect of birth origin on lived experience of trauma may have a larger impact on adult health than prenatal exposure only. Um, I would say that um, the primary prevention of genocide and the genocidal rape should be the uh, ultimate goal. But we know that if we continue to, ex uh, to hear about genocide and the wars around uh, the world, um, so this study does benefit uh, the communities that are already affected or who are being affected. And our work suggests that there is a potential um, to mitigate effect of prenatal or early life uh, exposure to um, genocide or wars or, or any um, psychological distress related to genocide or wars. If early uh, intervention, evidence-based intervention, are implemented as early as possible. In fact, any intervention at any point during the life of those who are exposed uh, we always have effect. Uh, as a next step, um, for me, uh, um, now I'm working on DNA methylation. As I mentioned above, I collected uh, uh, dry blood spots. So I'm working on uh, um, DNA methylation analysis uh, from the dry spot that I collected. Uh, to examine the epigenetic pathways potentially linking prenatal exposure to um, health outcome um, measured in this uh, in adulthood. Um, I also plan to uh, initiate a prospective um, study to better grasp health change as this population age and uh, um, study their pregnancies, uh, the pregnancies of this population and the spring to um, determine whether and how uh, genocidal trauma passes uh, to the next generation, and the court study will enable us to observe um, some of the uh, physical health outcome that we're not able to uh, observe at this time because this uh, population is still young. I also hope to be able to um, design some evidence-based intervention to, uh, for this population and similar population. I acknowledge the institution and people who helped me um, during this study, but also want to thank you all for your, uh, your presence and listening, and also special thanks to uh, um, SOAS and uh, uh, AGC Trust, and also Phil, thank you for, for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to share. Uh, your question and comment are very welcome. Um, thank you so much for attention. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Gloria. It's uh, such a, a rich presentation uh, in terms of the findings, but also I think the methodology might be quite interesting um, for, for many of the participants that I can see on the list here. Um, let me just take the slides off 
Um, and I'm hoping people might turn their cameras on as well, because that makes it a much more personal experience if, uh, if we can have the discussion time now by actually seeing people's faces. So um, uh, look, I want to throw it open um, to, for people to make their comments and ask their questions. Now, the way you can do this is at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little icon that has a hand in the air. If you just click that, then I'll know that you, you have a question that you'd like to ask. Um, and, and when I invite you to ask your question, if you could just introduce yourself, I think that would uh, help Gloria's a lot just to know exactly who you are. So, um, yeah, who, who would like to get us started? Yeah, Janan, thanks. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Phil and um, Glory. Uh, I actually listened to your presentation when I was in Rwanda, also organized by Aegis Trust and Phil Clark. So it's definitely my honor to listen to your more updated research this time. Uh, when I saw the ads Phil put on, I was like, yes, this is happening again. Um, so Mura um, <laughs> Chan. So I, I'm doing my uh, 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 PhD at SOAS. This is my last year, uh, but my research is slightly different from yours. It's more focusing on women's political empowerment and representation in the Rwandan context. So um, just by comparative lens, I find your research, as, as Phil pointed out, I find your research methodology a very interesting and intriguing because it's slightly, sorry about my phone, it's slightly, uh, diverging from a lot of SOAS uh, <laughs> methodologies, uh, as in, like, I think a lot of us at SOAS would employ, including myself, would employ, uh, like, ethnography as the methodology to do our research. And I found your research is incredibly, especially the result, is incredibly uh, rich and uh, I don't know how to describe it. It's in a way that I always find quantitative research or approach is overwhelming considering the results as well and how you would frame your results. But what really pumped to my head is, um, it's also a question that I had last time for you, but I didn't get the chance to ask you, is that how do you uh, actually view your relationships with your research subjects? As in, um, uh, same to um, audience who are like me sitting at the at the end of the computer. You you have a quite of a distance from your research subjects, and I'm wondering how you view your relationship with your research subjects, or do you even have research interlocutors that you also investigate and examine their life stories, um, uh, thinking about um, mental health from the genocide against Tutsi. Um, and um, further on, I would also like to know your opinion on um, the research ethics on biometrics, um, if, if that's for even related to, to your research. Yeah, that's from me. Thank you very much again. Great. Thanks, Jana. Thank you, Jana. So, so, some great questions there about methodology, about the epistemology, about ethics. Um, yeah, glorious. Thank you, Jana. And Rock was a challenge. And, uh, um, as you mentioned, this is uh, this research does build on the work that was uh, I conducted prior to my doctorate uh, uh, research that was funded by AGC Trust and so much uh, input from Phil and Nikki who provided mentorship and the group uh, from uh, AGC Trust, which used um, uh, uh, qualitative methods. So I did correct um, the stories I did and. Uh, interviews with uh, the young people we conceived via genocidal rape but i decided with my um doctoral research of course part of it i wanted to to do the qualitative but the time was not i didn't have enough time to do both to do a mixed method i use this qualitative method uh quantitative method because most of the work that has been done uh, was uh qualitative and we miss kind of like a systematic or quantifying the effect of genocide. So I believe both methods has uh, a place uh, or, or mixed method, uh, quantitative, qualitative, or each of, of those two uh, uh, approaches, they have a place and they have a role to play. And it's always good to be able to, in a, in a given uh, population targeted by different researchers, to do con uh, contribution from the, those different angles. So I do want also to comment about those two methods in terms of my relationship with uh, the study participant. 
these people, they do, I, I relate to them because I'm Rwandan, because I, I understand their experience and some of their experiences related to my own experience. Uh, so it is, I don't know if I would say that is personal. So it is my population that I'm studying. So I'm, I do, I, I'm connected with them and I do emotionally connect with them. The analysis and conducting this study was not easy for me, especially when I start making a sense the result. To be honest with you, I did cry a couple of times. I continue to cry, which is not bad. It's a process of healing. It's a process of relating to these people and also building more commitment to this, my population uh, of study. And of course, moving away from the idea that they are subject, they are human beings. They are people that we know. We know their name, we are, they are our neighbors, or they are people that you've traveled to Rwanda and you see them which I think your approach of uh, ethnographic approach is really very good. Part of it is also building that relationship. And it's not just understanding the experience or being personal, it is also being able to understand the context of these people that is beyond what can be captured by uh, uh, a standardized scale or even an interview um, a guide that you can develop because you understand the context of these people. You can be able to make sense of these people. Of course, there is something that there is uh, some at some point that where you need to distance yourself a little bit with data to be able to see objectively, which I do appreciate by working with a group of people who some of them are not Rwandans and ask can ask me some question that I wouldn't ask myself or can help me to see when I'm going beyond and more becoming more emotional and not uh, uh, objective. So um, I don't know if I answered all your question in terms of. Uh, uh, um, um ethic i think uh using by uh um markers taking the uh different uh um like the way that i, I did uh brad sports uh i did uh i went through the uic university of united chicago irb uh to get this approved and i did put in my uh constant form the implication and what I'm going to use with this blood sample. So for example, what I said, uh, testing the uh, C-reactive protein and DNA methylation to see if the exposure to uh, genocide has changed the way that their gene function, that was mentioned. But I also did mention that I'm not going to use these blood samples beyond those two things, unless if I go back and ask them permission. So for example, those who want me to keep their blood sample and maybe go back and do other studies from the blood samples that I collected, they sent for me and they gave me uh, um, details, contact details for me to go back and ask permission to do something else that was not mentioned in my research. So one of the things that I'm, I'm, thinking, I'm, I'm kind of like reflecting on is when, so vulnerable population, uh, sensitive topic like the genocide, these are the areas that need research. But sometimes we are more scared of ethics and being overprotected uh, by uh, the gatekeepers or maybe the Arabic committees that uh, uh, protect these people and they prevent to be, to these people to be studied, to be researched, which means that whatever intervention we should, we should be designing for them is being either designed based on other population or we are missing out their needs and not be able to design the, 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 the uh, interventions. I don't know if I answered all your questions, <laughs> but you can always reach out to me if you have further uh, questions. Thank you. That, yeah, that's great. I'm glad we got the methodological issues um, out on the table because I think looking down the list, those of you that um, that I know and myself included are very much qualitative researchers. And, you know, Gloria, as you have a very different methodology working on very sensitive topics with a, a, a tool that would be very foreign to most of us. So I think it's useful to tease out um, some of these issues. Um, so I can see Ernest. Um, hand up this is great too this is uh, also a good way to uh, catch up with a lot of people that i think some of us all know but haven't seen in a long time so uh, yeah ernest over to you and then i'm going to come to felix okay thank you phil thank you glory can you hear me yes you're very clear ernest. hey glory Bravo. Bravo, and ernest, maybe if you i know you know gloria but maybe if you could introduce yourself because i think others would like to know um who you are and where you're based at the moment Hey, my name is Ernest, and I'm a colleague and friend to Glorious. We're growing kind of together, and I'm so much excited, and I'm so glad that she's sharing with us this important piece of research. 
I would like to, uh, I, I, I myself got PhD in peace and development research, and I worked on this uh, particular approach of uh, intimate dimension of genocide. I, it's something I kind of share with her. It's something I've been going through, and like my colleague who asked before, it's sometimes not easy to take a distance away of the violence, and I appreciate that Gloria has been so courageous enough to to have the take into the business. So mine is uh, um, a suggestion in the, in the conclusion of the findings. There is somewhere you argued that some of the participants have uh, do somehow construct the how can I say their experience of the genocide, the rape during the genocide as the most atrocious, how can I say, then, as the, uh, the most atrocious than the genocide itself. I, I do quite understand and I uh, agree with you, but maybe I do have a suggestion on how you can formulate it otherwise. Otherwise, you lose the historical and the legal aspects of the violence. Uh, what, if, uh, what if you consider it as they just take that intimate dimension of the the violence, you know, what remained attached to their own being in the aftermath than, you know, other aspects or other acts of the genocide. So that rape is not, uh, how can I say, separated from the genocide, but it's still part of the acts of the genocide itself. Maybe it's, mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I don't formulate it in a very correct way, but uh, no, in a not clear way, but it's something you can look at and which is quite reflecting what you've been presenting, which has no different anyway. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ernest. And uh, this is was I, I I understand what you are saying, and I'm not saying that uh, that the uh, genocide rape is uh, worse than the genocide itself. This is a quote from the participant in one of my uh, other interviews. This is kind of like a saying what participants say, it, you know, when you say, and you know that some of the, these women who were raped, sometimes they would say that I wish I would have died instead of being raped and survived this way. But this doesn't try to compare the genocide itself and the genocide rape. So I do get your, your, your point. This was just a quote, though the presentation, I didn't have enough time to say this is a quote and just put it there. Thing. But thank you so much for, 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 for your um, And maybe coming yeah. back to, to the sorry, methodology. Yeah, sorry, sorry. yeah, I want to say something that I forgot to uh, answer when I was uh, answering the first question about the methodology, the qualitative and the quantitative. One of the things that I experienced that was really not a good, ex not quite a good experience for me, I, it was uh, by using structured uh, uh, interview skills, I miss listening to participants. Somehow I felt like cheating to them. They wanted to tell me more, but I wanted to say yes or no, or strongly agree or disagree. So I did have a time after the interviews to let them uh, uh, express their emotion and share what they want to share. But you understand when you have a questionnaire, there are so many things that you are collecting as a data collector, but you are not allowing the participants to share what they want to share. So I had to cut them in some at some points because each interview uh, uh, did take like uh, maybe one hour, one hour and a half. So, but I provided time at the end just to add on what I said before. Uh, Felix. <coughs> Yes, can you hear me? Yes, Felix, you're very clear. How are you doing? Yes, <laughs> I do. I. Yes, Muraho, Muraho. Muraho, Neza. Ego. Glorious, thank you so much for uh, sharing with us this interesting study. Of course, my name is Felix. I'm working for Prison Fellowship Rwanda, and uh, I usually uh, uh, work with genocide perpetrators, but also with uh, genocide survivors. I conducted a research on the identity of genocide perpetrators, uh, of course, with the support of Aegis Trust. And uh, I'm very uh, inspired by hearing from this study. And uh, I was 
impressed, I'm impressed by the, the test used method, both for mental and the physical and biological. I think this method is really uh, unique and based on uh, the way it has been conducted and based on the way you presented the result. Uh, I have uh, maybe two comments. Uh, you, you, talk, you said about uh, uh, the use of children born of uh, genocide survivors who were uh, raped and uh, those genocide survivors were not raped, and uh, of course you talked about uh, that those born from uh, those who are raped are presenting, I mean, uh, mental severe mental health or trauma compared to those who uh, are born from uh, those who are not raped, and uh, that is one point, and. Um, uh, Maybe I was uh, curious to know, maybe uh, to hear from you to elaborate more about the, uh, based on the research, to elaborate more about the uh, the way the way of the mode or the way of transmission of the trauma, of course, and uh, how was it transmitted? Given that, of course, you shared about your your, your method, touched about the biological and the physical and the mental health maybe to elaborate more about, uh, based on your findings, the way of uh, that kind of transmission of trauma. Uh, and also, I, I was interested to hear that you talk about adverse childhood experience. Uh, and also, you mentioned about supportive families and also resilience. Uh, I think that maybe, uh, suppose that, maybe both youth born from uh, genocide survivors were not raped and those were who were raped of course uh, depending on the experience and change they maybe they grew up in different circumstances and uh, also we we usually meet with some challenges for example the the, the issue of silence silence on sharing about the trauma to the descendants and uh, also uh, in some way it is related also to the mental health of uh, their parents if the parents have not yet uh, uh, been helped psychologically maybe they are not ready to provide such kind of uh, enabling environment that could help their, their descendants uh, to develop away so uh, Maybe what maybe from your experience and result, if also you you met with the challenge of this challenge of not talking, uh, keeping silent and not sharing to the descendants about the truth of the the suffering they went through to their children. So that is what uh, my my few comments. If you can elaborate more on, on uh, those two points, it will be helpful. And also, I thank you so much for this interesting study. Great. Thanks very much, Felix. Um, yeah, glorious. Thank you so much, Felix, for uh, the question. Uh, so for the transmission, that is the phase I'm uh, on. I, uh, as I said, I collected uh, blood, uh, uh, dried blood spot uh, samples to be able to uh, look at the epigenetic mechanism that link exposure to uh, prenatal exposure or adverse childhood experience to uh, the health outcome that was uh, observed during the, the study. But the prior research that have looked at those uh, um, mechanisms, they have suggested the intergenerational uh, 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 transmission of trauma and this can be seen in two ways, either uh, uh, transmission prenatally, exposure to the maternal stress, because you know the body does sense the, uh, uh, the, our environment. So when the environment that we are in, we do sense it and it does affect or does uh, influence our epigenome. So it doesn't change the gene by itself, but it can change the way that the uh, gene function, especially for the uh, um, uh, during the prenatal period where the mother is exposed and the stress uh, is able to affect to reach out to, to the, to the uh, child because usually in a normal time 
the mother has the capacity to, or the, the placenta or the whole protection around the, the uh, embryo is capable to do protect the child against the stress. Uh, when it is a stress related to genocide or genocidal rape, when it's beyond the, uh, the measures, the, the, uh, the buffering system of the mother, then the stress can reach to the, to the child. The child will sense this uh, environment, this stressful environment, and then their epigenome can adapt to, can change the way that the genes that function to adapt that stress. So that affected their development of organs and, and systems and their function, which later does affect uh, um, the health outcomes in adulthood, even during the childhood. For example, children born of uh, women who are exposed to stress, most of the time that we uh, find them with low birth weight, which has been connected with most of uh, chronic disease uh, in uh, adulthood. So the one of uh, kind of like agreement that is among the res uh, researchers who do uh, uh, biomedical research on this topic, there is the uh, um, uh, implication of uh, stress, uh, um, stress uh, regression uh, regre uh, system, the stress system of the body, the system that help us to deal with the system. It gets affected if the stress is repeated, is strong, and gets beyond the, uh, uh, the ability of the body to uh, affect, uh, negatively affect uh, the body. Not just, uh, the body is no longer just able to manage the stress, but it gets, I think that is where I mentioned the way and the tier of the, the stress uh, system. Uh, of the body, this, the, the uh, way and the tear of the, the body, when the, system, the, the, the response to, to, to stress does affect or does uh, damage uh, uh, the system that's involved in that uh, management. So I'm still studying that, but one of the suggestions is the implication of the system uh, uh, regression um, uh, system in the uh, body that does, uh, can be affected and deeply affected by exposure to genocide. In terms of uh, um, parents who are not sharing, I think that's uh, something that needs to be looked at a little bit more closely, why they don't share and what can facilitate them to be able to share. The transmission of uh, um, stress also can be postnatal. When the stress of the, the parents, not the mother only, the parents can influence the way that they parent their children. That's also another way of like it, uh, directly affect the uh, health of the, the child, or of their, their offspring. So uh, postnatal is very important. That's why I look at the adverse childhood experience, but also the thing that we're saying when the, the, the children don't know what is going on, but yet they can experience the, the environment of somebody who is struggling with whatever they're struggling with. So I would say that the, this needs to be looked at a little bit more closely by looking at why not sharing what is uh, what can be done? So maybe we can discuss uh, about it uh, later and hear it a bit more because that's where we can maybe be able to see advice what to do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Did you want to come back on that? Sir? Yes. Yes. Thanks, Felix. Sorry. Felix, did you have a follow-up question? I just saw your hand go up again. So. <laughs> Maybe um, I'll abuse my position as chair, Gloria, because um, I have a, a question that I'd like to ask. I, it's interesting that there are so many discussions at the moment about issues of inheritance and issues of transmission after the genocide sensitivity, and these are... Um, Felix, Felix, I might just have to get other people to mute their microphone. Sorry, there's a bit of background noise there. Yeah, so there, there's a lot of discussion about inheritance and transmission um, in the post-genocide context, and it's often about the transmission of trauma. It's often about the transmission of guilt um, to younger Rwandans. And I think what's remarkable about your work is that you're showing that there's a important degree of transmission that's happening prenatally. Um, which I think is very different from what a lot of the literature talks about that strikes me as incredibly important for that reason. So first thing I wanted to know, can you give us a sense of how many children born of rape there are likely to be in Rwanda? So can you just give us a sense of the scale? Like what percentage of the population do you think is affected by the issues that you're presenting here? 
But more importantly, I'm interested in, and this is maybe a bit more of a qualitative question. What is your sense of the people that you're interviewing, the people that you're surveying, how much do they internalize this issue of genocidal rape as a part of their own identity? How conscious are they of the issues that you're raising? Is it something that they talk about? Is it something that they deploy when they describe themselves in their own experience? How, how, how conscious is this identity in that particular segment of the population? Because I think that, that would tell us a lot about how they manoeuvre through society, um, how they understand their own agency, how conscious they are of the challenges that they're dealing with. So, yeah, just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the the profile, but also the consciousness of, of these particular actors. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Phil, for the question. I um, It is hard to know how many children were born out of uh, uh, genocide or rape. The estimation I just very, the range is very broad. They estimate between 2,000, and some papers also goes up to 50,000. So the number is quite not known. But from my data, um, the, the, uh, a big portion of it, they're affected by, uh, um, by this experience. For example, for PTSD, uh, more than half of them, they meet kind of, so the skills I use are just, uh, uh, they, are not, they, they don't diagnose but they can uh, uh, give a sense. So there is a cutoff of on PTSD scale that uh, suggests that somebody need a medical attention. So for example, that scale, more than 50% of what I uh, interviewed, they, they meet the criteria of needing some attention. So I would say that they're affected. And the very reason that they participated in this study and other studies that I have uh, 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 conducted, it is because they are conscient of their life experience and they want it to be known and they do carry that identity. So from the time I started talking with these young people, as soon as they start looking, like identifying that they are, they, there's something about their birth without knowing through the process of uh, uh, disclosure of birth uh, origins and also learning and uh, navigating what does it mean to be born of genocidal rape. That's something they carry and I think it's part of their identity. When I, me I met with them uh, uh, during this study, of course they have a sense of resilience. They have a sense of like uh, speak standing together and uh, be able to not to be so much affected by the identity which they claim that they, they are, it's not their fault that they were born of genocide or rape. They, they don't know, the, most of them, they don't know their fathers and they shouldn't be seen as uh, children of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, children of enemies or like they are associated at anyhow by the sin of their fathers. Ignored the biologically, they're associated with the father, but they do know the mothers and they do claim that identity to be uh, this, uh, not associated with the crime of their fathers. And in particular, during this study, they were very willing to look at how probably biologically and beyond just the experience of maybe the identity, how does this affect their lives? Especially they were very interested when I was corrected the biomarkers uh, uh, because they wanted to know how does this kind of like environmental experience does penetrate my skin and change my biology, my biology in, in a way that can affect my health. So they, they know um, the experience and they are willing to learn more about their lives. But again, I sense a lot of uh, 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 effort to be resilient, to, to, to live in a better society, contribute to the Rwandan society uh, uh, reconciliation, but also for themselves to have a better, uh, a better life. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we've got time, I think, for a couple more questions. Um, let me go to Felix and Dehinda. Hi, Felix. Might have, it might, you might be on mute, Felix. I think there's a chance. Okay, maybe while Felix and Dehinder's getting his connection sorted out, Felix Bagabo, do you have another question? Because I can see your hand up. I'm not sure if it's a, quest, a hand left over from before or if it's a, a new question. Okay, it was an old one. 
Phil, can I ask again? Yeah, please, Ernest. Yeah, yeah, please do. Thank you. I, I was thinking about the the other observation I made. I thought about something else that could be related to to that. Right. Uh, well, maybe uh, the, uh, how do you relate the the issue of proximity of you know victims and you know, victims and perpetrators? How do you relate it, and how does it come? in the analysis it's something that can help you because the victims knew even if they were somehow in the other community but they knew most of their victims there is a way of knowing you can understand they might not know the names but they knew how they knew who they were they were their neighbors so that issue of proximity then can lead to the the the, 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 the intimate dimension of the violence which then helps in an analysis analyzing the the issue of rape in more societal context, in a more general context than it's kind of appearing right now. But it's a suggestion. It's not a question in itself. Thank <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ernest. That's a good suggestion. It's not something that I looked at during this study, but I think that also has a contribution. As I say this, uh, young adult can be affected either prenatally but postnatal in terms of uh, adverse childhood experience that also include the community, that also include what is around them. So postnatal uh, uh, um, environment is very key and the, as you say, the being close to the victim, sometimes it can be something that can uh, kind of like exacerbate the experience, but also can be maybe something that also help them to build some resilience. So that's something that needs really to be explored. Um, as I said, these young people can be affected through the genocide, but also uh, I did present the demographic characteristics. Also, they are lived experience after uh, being born, not only by being raised by parents who, who experienced the genocide or, 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 or genocidal rape, but also their lives. They're exposed to so many other things that follow their birth uh, origin or follow um, the exposure of their mothers that also continue to uh, exacerbate the effect on their lives. If the better life, uh, uh, the environment is better, then the health impact can be uh, reduced or mitigated or even have access on a treatment or support that they need to be able to continue to move forward despite their birth origins. So Gloria is, I, I think uh, Felix and Dehinder is having troubles with his microphone, but he's just added a question in the chat. Um, and he said his questions about the nature of adverse childhood experiences, he says, were the experiences broken down in the study and did different adverse experiences lead to different outcomes? Yeah, that's a good question, Felix. Thank you so much. That's something that I haven't worked on. As you can tell, I collected a lot of data the scale, the way that is, is, is uh, was developed by uh, WHO, by the way, it was uh, suggested to be used as a, a, a score, a total score, not break it, uh, break it down. But that's something I want to look at because I believe uh, um, each individual uh, adverse experience can be linked to different maybe health outcomes. That's something that I want to look at it. And I also did add a question to open-ended question because the scale was had never been used in Rwanda to be able to capture that what is not included into the international questionnaires, especially because the experience is, is different. So that's another uh, type of data, qualitative data that I need to analyze to understand a little bit more. But the way that is used in this study, it was uh, the total score or, uh, out of like the, uh, the, the sum of all the um, adverse childhood experience. I can see a hand from Marianne. And, and it was used as a, a, as a continuous variable because in some studies they do break it down maybe to four uh, um, adverse childhood experience and above and less or less than four, but I used it as a, a um, continuous uh, variable. Thanks. Um, Marianne. Hi, um, Gloria. So, um, uh, thank you for, for a, a very uh, interesting um, uh, presentation. Um, I uh, <clears throat> I uh, uh, have done 
uh, not direct research in Rwanda myself, but I have worked with researchers in Rwanda and then um, have helped uh, write uh, some of uh, write up some of the research and 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 frame it in 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 theoretical frameworks. Um, so I've I've. I've worked with the research population without actually having done um, direct research uh, myself. Um, but my question is um, uh, more about uh, in the future, because what you um, what I thought you mentioned at one point is that you also would like to do research um, on the uh, after after possible interventions that you that you would like to do interventions and then do follow-up research um, the the kind of um, the, the project that that I have been associated with in, in Rwanda um, is a is a, a community-based sociotherapy um, we have other people who are associated with this um, uh, um, uh, program in 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 the audience as well um, um, many of them who, who have have much more experience than I do, but I am I am interested in what kind of uh, what kind of interventions you're thinking about. You might like to use to do post intervention um, research. Great. Thank you so much Great. for for the for the question. Uh, I. I'm, I haven't yet get there, but I've been thinking about various, I'm thinking that I will have to collaborate with other people because my research program is kind of like a big, something that I can't, I can't handle by myself. But given that I know that the uh, group therapy or, or uh, psychology, community psychological therapy and the group therapy has been explored in Rwanda, those are very good and they have been helpful. and. Uh, but I feel like kind of like an individual and probably using some of the, uh, the technology to make it accessible to the young people, especially because I'm focusing on this young generation and these younger people who may be able to do some individual online interventions that are accessible to them on a kind of like an easier way. But I haven't been there. I do not know exactly what health outcome I'm going to target because I'm looking at physical and mental health outcomes. But I'm thinking like looking at not only the community that have been explored in Rwanda, be able to advise them, be able to explore them among the younger people, but also looking at uh, individual and things that can be much easier, uh, uh, much uh, accessible to the Rwandan population. In particular, because we do not have a health system that is that easy, uh, uh, easily accessible as in many other countries, and probably you may be in a remote area or you may not have uh, the, the, the right person to provide that intervention. Those are the ideas. I haven't yet get there, but I'm thinking that something that can be accessible, especially to these younger people and the people who do not make, want to even be seen or be open to go to the regular social community or the regular health facilities what else can we put in place for people to 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 to, to work on i've uh, tried uh, with it we have worked on something uh called uh, writing for healing that's another thing some people don't, don't have necessarily a, a mental problem that they need a psychiatrist but probably they need to process their experience through writing and be able to get somebody to reflect on the writing and go through this healing process. So I'm thinking when I get there, I will explore those different interventions. But thank you so much. And maybe I will keep in touch and uh, learn from yes. what you're doing. Thank you, thank for, you. Your, thank you for your mm -hmm. answer. Thank you. Um, we've got time for one last question. If anyone has a, a burning comment or question that they'd like to pose to Gloriez. Yeah, Jeanan. I mean, if I don't have to go if somebody else who hasn't spoken yet uh, wants to raise a question to Gloria. It, I think it's fine. I, I, All right. Your first question was fantastic, so I think we would welcome another one. <laughs> yeah, sure. I, I'd love to ask another question to, to Gloria. Uh, it's actually about while I was listening to you responding to other people's questions, I was thinking of your uh, future plans about this research project that you've been conducting for a very long time, I believe, from your doctoral research to now postdoctoral research. I'm also just thinking, um, 
I think a lot of us who do Rwandan studies, let's say if there is a thing, <laughs> there is such a thing, uh, we are very committed to uh, knowledge production within the Rwandan context. But I'm also very concerned about how do we go beyond the Rwandan context in a way that how do we generate theories and concepts from the Rwandan st studies, and then we can apply the concepts from Rwandan studies to other contexts. Uh, I believe there are a lot of other post-conflict post societies and contexts could actually make a good use of your research results, Gloria, such as, I don't know, I can name a lot. So I'm just thinking, uh, what is your next, uh, what is your next step, basically? Are you going to broadening up your research scale to other um, genocide or con post-conflict scenarios, or are you um, going to be more focused on some other research uh, projects going on uh, for Rwandan uh, still uh, for, for Rwandan population. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Janan. Thank you, Janan. Right. Um, that's a great question. Yes, I'm interested to also go beyond the uh, um, Rwandan community to other communities. Uh, um, part of the project we are working with uh, ADC Trust and uh, uh, feel involved is looking it's first using the peace education to produce some um, lesson that can be applied to other uh, um, places so I'm hoping also with my own program research that I'll be able to build on those kind of relationship study other communities but I'm also interested to look at uh, not only a direct violence effect on health but also structural uh, uh, violence we do live in the world currently that people are on a daily basis experiencing structural violence and those also do put people under stress and there are so many things that can be done so i'm looking to uh, i'm looking for any opportunity to also study other uh, population of course rwanda would be my primary uh, target but also want to and also publication that's part of it and being able i'm, I'm grateful for this opportunity to to present this is a way of uh, uh, sharing um so I, I i hope to be able to go beyond and be able to share my lesson learned from rwanda to other uh, uh, population fantastic um that strikes me as a a pretty good place at, to wrap up this discussion. A question about the applicability of Gloria's your really fascinating study to context uh, far beyond Rwanda. I think the question time here has been really useful at teasing out a little bit more about your methodology, about the people that uh, you've been surveying, some of the concepts that you're working with, how this connects to other studies and other literatures that people are engaging with um, and also how this relates perhaps to, to places far beyond Rwanda. So I think all of those questions just show the richness of your work and, and, and how relevant it is, uh, including for many of us here who are thinking about these issues but coming at it from very different angles. So uh, this is really important research. I think we're all fascinated to see uh, where you take it um, from here because there's clearly a, a lot of different directions that this could go in both academically but also in a practitioner sense so glorious thank you so much um a, a quick plug for uh, Phil, one, yeah, one, sorry, one thing before yeah one thing that i want since we are with different researchers who are involved in rwanda one other thing that i did mention in my next step is to share the result with my population i think there is an ethical and moral responsibility to go back and share with them not in the way that is stigmatizing or the way that they will read it through these english papers and don't understand what this means to them i want to go back and share with them so I, uh, this is my next project actually my very next project as soon as we are able to travel with the university money because i can travel with the university money <laughs> so when we will be able to go back and uh, talk with the, uh, this community explain what does this mean and and also from there i feel uh the ethical responsibility to kind of like do uh, uh, co uh participatory research with them and start asking them what are the questions that matters for them that future research should focus on so that we are serving the human being as i said uh, uh before we are collaborating with them but we're also going back to uh, give back and share with them what we have uh, um and not just to publish and uh, get other um, academic benefit. Sorry for uh, disturbing you. Not at all. And I think Marianne wanted to just jump in on this. Yeah, just a very um, co quick comment on on um, 
you going back to share um, the 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 results of your research with your research population, which I which I think is 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 a wonderful thing to do, and I'm I, I salute you for doing it. But I was wondering, wouldn't that in itself be an intervention you could study? Yes, I will. It is an intervention. I will collect data on that, and I will because there is no guidance, there's no uh, uh, protocols on how you do share this. Um, finding that are not that so positive, though so motivating. Uh, some researchers they even call them bad news. How do you? There's no protocol. So I'm I'm going to use this opportunity to go and share because I feel this is eth ethically the correct thing to do, but also correct data and try to come up with a protocol that can be used with by other researchers. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, that seems a really important point to emphasize is, you know, this work, Gloria, as I think is so important academically, but it's clearly so applicable in a practitioner and a policy sense um, that you're raising really important questions about a, a generation of young Rwandans dealing with particular legacies of the 1994 genocide. And um, one would hope that, that that starts to filter into the policy and the practitioner space as well. So. But this has always been one of the beauties of your work, I think, that it's it's so uh, scholarly rich, but also so important uh, from a practical point of view as well. So um, I'm glad you were able to to bring some of that out at, towards the end of the presentation. Um, uh, just a very quick plug for the, the next and also the final uh, webinar in uh, the Centre on Conflict Rights and Justice series uh, this term. It just so happens that we've got another event on Rwanda. It doesn't always happen like this, but this term it has. Um, a final event on the 21st of June, we've got Omar McDoom from the London School of Economics um, presenting his recent book called um, The Path to a Genocide. Um, so this is based on his sort of 15 or nearly 20 years uh, of field work, looking at the, the, the micro causes of the genocide in 1994. So, um, so Omar will be with us on Monday, the 21st of June. I do hope that people will be able to join us for that. Once again, just a huge thank you to Gloria for, for sharing her, uh, her fascinating and really important research with us uh, this evening. And also to all of you who I know have joined us from around the world um, as part of the audience. It's been a, a real pleasure to have all of you Thank you very much, and uh, and look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.